Hello, everyone. I'm Carol Fleck, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD experts presentation titled How to Leverage Sports Psychology to Benefit ADHD Brains. Leading today's presentation is Dr. Don Brown. Dr. Brown, who is known as the MD with ADHD, was diagnosed when she was completing her child psychiatry fellowship program. How's that for timing? <laughs> she <laughs> is the founder and CEO of ADHD Wellness Center and Mental Health Letics, where she serves as a sports psychiatrist consultant for elite and retired athletes of college and national sports organizations. Dr. Brown seeks to reduce the stigma around mental illness and dispel myths and misperceptions about diagnosis and treatment through her number one bestseller, the ADHD Lifestyle Series, Secrets from an MD with ADHD, her podcast, From ADHD to Amaze Ability, and her weekly Facebook Live events. In today's webinar, we'll discuss how to build and maintain a sports mentality. You might be surprised to learn that elite, elite athletes and people with ADHD have a few traits in common, including hyperfocus and creative thinking. But you don't need to be an athlete to learn from Dr. Brown's playbook. She'll explain how routines, a positive mindset, nutrition, and sleep all benefit ADHD brains. We'd like to begin today's webinar by asking this poll question to our live audience. If you've abandoned a routine, what helped you to get back in the game? Please select your answers and comment in the text box under the video player to tell us more. And while you do that, I'll point out that live participants may submit questions anytime during the live event. To download the slides, click on the event resources section of your webinar screen. If you are interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you'll receive about an hour after the live broadcast. A transcript of today's event will be made available in the coming week. If you're listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 449 to access the slides, the webinar replay, the certificate of attendance option, and the webinar transcript. And if you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe. Sign up now and you'll receive our exciting upcoming summer issue. We celebrate moms. We know how much she does and takes on to care for her family. So we've included a self-care guide for her well-being. We also celebrate strong, empowered women who have decided to forego parenting and focus on healthy living. Our summer issue also includes a guide to help dads and other role models teach boys with ADHD the importance of social skills with expert advice on creating deeper bonds. Plus, what you need to know about the vitamins and supplements that can ease ADHD symptoms. And as the summer months approach, we feature amazing audiobooks that will engage even the most reluctant readers in middle and high school. Sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Finally, the sponsor of this webinar is Inflow. Inflow is the number one app to help you manage your ADHD. Developed by leading clinicians, Inflow is a science-based self-help program based on the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. Join Inflow today to better understand and manage your ADHD. Click the link on the screen to learn more. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So without further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Dawn Brown. Thank you so much for joining us today and for leading this discussion. From basketball to swimming and gymnastics, the sports world filled with elite athletes who have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and who have dominated in the respective athletes are pictured here. In fact, research suggests that ADHD may be more common in elite athletes, around 7%, 8% of athletes have the condition compared to two to 5% of the general population. 
Each athlete pitching here has ADHD, as I stated, and many say ADHD gives them the edge, while others say that sports give them the healthy outlet for their symptoms. In his 2001 book, It's Only a Game, NFL legend, broadcaster, entertainer, Terry Bradshaw described his life with undiagnosed ADHD as, I truly wish I had been treated for ADHD when I was a child, so I might have been able to reach my potential academically, he wrote but I wasn't tested, I struggled, and football, I found my answers. Some athletes like Chris Madzer, a four-time Olympian who won silver in the men's single ludge at the 2018 Winter Olympics, compared his sport to being his medicine, while others have used their sport as major behavioral management tools. Lewis Smith, a silver and bronze medalist on the, on the Pommel horse across three Olympic games and a winner of several world and European championship medals, said that gymnastics was an outlet for his symptoms. He quoted, it gave me the tools necessary to channel my ADHD throughout my childhood. He wrote in his 2018 retirement message. So how can sports psychology help ADHD or adults with ADHD? Thank you Attitude for having me. It is an honor to be here on your platform. Well, from my perspective and me working with athletes who have ADHD, I've realized amazing ideas about this. Sports psychology helps athletes improve their performance. Using goal setting, attention in sports, we may refer to as focus points, you know, motivation, coping skills, teamwork, leadership, and even burnout. Having ADHD myself, this sounds like something I could use in my own toolbox every single day. But listen, elite athletes are human beings who just happen to be athletic. So sports psychology can help improve everyone's performance, even if you're not an athlete or sports official. I thank my ADHD patients and elite athletes as their pharmacological manager, but also as their executive functioning coach. It's because of them that I became more aware of a new perspective and way approach to managing ADHD and helping others do so as well. My main focus of ADHD when I look at that, I look at the biological, the psychological, the social, and the behavioral approach to managing ADHD, which has been very effective for some. I found that there are health strategies that both groups, athletes and adults with ADHD, can use to maximize their performance and their productivity. And I suggest there are subtle differences. So let's redefine what it means to win. Instead of approaching ADHD coaching and behavioral management as focusing on the actual goal, the end goal, which can benefit some, today I'm offering a new perspective on what it means to champion your ADHD, essentially what it means to win. See, winning doesn't always mean to accomplishing your goal that you set for. Some of us know that having ADHD and setting goals, we can also set ourselves up for failure, especially if those goals are unrealistic, right? The timing to achieve that goal, can, we can also think that's unreasonable. And it's because of how ADHD can impact how we approach achieving the goal within that certain time frame. The expectations that society has, that we may have, that we may also internalize from society that to become our own expectations can often become problematic and dangerous. Why? Well, because there's no one way approach to best manage one's ADHD especially since ADHD impacts individuals differently. So for those of us who have felt ashamed and guilty and sensitive, offended, defeated, judged, angry, frustrated, or just flat out mad about having a condition that does not allow us to perform or produce our best work or self-regulate our emotions consistently and effectively, I invite you on a journey to learn strategies of how you can optimize your lifestyle by creating a winning attitude just like athletes. Now for the innocent athlete, you should be kidding, playing at your best game. But for those of us who have ADHD, let's define winning as doing our best work. So I want you to take this perspective on, on this journey with me. In working with these two groups, elite athletes, as well as adults with ADHD, I realize that there are common traits among elite athletes and those with ADHD. I also realize how both groups, if managed correctly and healthy-wise, 
can identify realistic approaches to how the other group manages their traits to perform and produce optimal results. I mean, look at this list. Curiosity, hyperfocus, our creative thinking, a way of thinking, our impulse control, our resilience, failing, failing, time and time again, only to eventually succeed. Multitasking, right? Performing under pressure. Some of us do well with that. Some of us don't. Some of us do well with that. We procrastinate because that's the pressure we create for ourselves. And then others, we got to plan it out in order to achieve our optimal way of performing well. And then to some degree, we all can be risk takers. And I know I don't have too much time today because this is such an exciting topic, but I want to offer you a three-step system that I use to teach athletes who may or may not have ADHD that want to achieve what many of us with ADHD struggle with achieving. That's optimal performance, optimal productivity, and healthy self-regulations and inhibitions. And this can be done. This can be achieved. Like myself, I've learned this late in the game due to a late diagnosis at age 31. So who said we can't learn to incorporate or adapt new strategies for our life? You know, my playbook consists of getting you back in the game of life or in your sport when you notice that your performance is low or your motivation is poor. Performance coaching or conditioning. I'll mention three routines that will create the foundation for sustaining focus, managing moods, and also completing tasks. And then finally, we're going to discuss the essential meal plan that consists of pharmacological management and foods that I found to be effective for our brains. So let's start with the coach's playbook. I work with athletes to help keep them on a, playing le a level playing field so they can demonstrate their true abilities in the game they play. The same goes for kids and adults with ADHD. I coach them or I help with their pharmacological management so that their ability is reflected in the work that they do whether that's school or at work. But all patients I work with need to know in how their brain works. This is where it starts, how it's wired, so that they know what to do when they do feel tired. They're irritable, they're unmated to go, go to the gym, you know, when they need to be aroused and focused and energized. You know, we all have our own ADHD profile. Learn it. It comes to terms with your own ADHD idiosyncrasies. Do you make careless mistakes? Are your person that often misplaces things? Some of us may speak out of turn and others may watch TV for hours due to our distractibility or our, our inattention. But also learn the commonalities between us all, of all of us who have ADHD that is, and how ADHD affects our brains. Here you have pictured four parts of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, the basal ganglia, and the limbic system, and the RAS. And the simple point I wanna make here is that it's important to learn the basic biology of how your brain operates so that you can respond with practical solutions. So what do I mean by this? Well, in all four sections of this brain, particularly the RES and the limbic system, as you can see here, dopamine is deficient. Notably, dopamine plays a major role in the brain's reward circuit. And as you can see here as well, pictured, dopamine functions in our rewards our motivation, our pleasures, our motor functioning, our compulsions, and our perseverations. So our perseverations, I know, is an interesting term. It's a medical term that we use often in psychiatry, and it's when someone gets stuck. Does that sound like anybody? <laughs> we get stuck on topics and ideas, on how bad we did, on behaviors, our actions, our emotions. So people who perseverate can often say the same thing or behave in the same way over and over again. They're stuck. But I want to focus on a few points here as well. So let's look at the nucleus accumbens, this area here. It's a part of the brain that is made of the pleasure center, the arousal center, the motivation and reward center. It releases dopamine. From research, we know that people unmotivated or are tired, there, there's a disturbance in dopamine. Many people with ADHD have trouble managing rewards and stimulants and being stimulated and being aroused. So they take medications used to increase dopamine. And this is one of the best points I want to make is that sometimes we can't do that ourselves just by thinking about it. We actually need outside or external things like medications that help us release that, 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 that neurotransmitter dopamine. And dopamine is related to the reward processing in the brain 
and is linked to the only recipient of the reward. So this misconception is easy to make for everyone. The increase in dopamine may increase us getting to our rewards. And the deficiency of dopamine definitely leads to less rewards. So what I mean by this is when you think about dopamine increasing, you're already thinking about the reward being achieved. However, it is often missed that dopamine actually creates the anticipation of the reward. Therefore, there is a greater anticipation of the reward then more rewards can be achieved. This distinction between anticipation and the recipient of the reward is key to understanding the influence of the dopaminergic pathways on the functions that you see listed here. Some elite athletes get this. They, they, you know, they, that's why they use intense training. The intense training gets them to receive the optimal performance that they need or that they seek. The late great Kobe Bryant's Mamba mentality, for example, is the perfect example of this. Kobe Bryant had five pillars of his legendary mindset, which included passion, obsession, rest, um, relentlessness, resiliency, and fearlessness. You know, I literally saw him go beyond what any ordinary elite athlete would do. And many of his teammates and other NBA players would comment on it. You know, he would get up at 4 a.m. when no one else does and get to working out. I've personally seen him stay after the game. He might have even won the game, but he would actually not focus on the score. He would focus on where on the court he missed that shot and practice it relentlessly over and over and over again, right after filling or completing a full game. Kobe is also known to study the referee's playbook, <laughs> wanting to know where on the court they were positioned so he could get away with certain plays. And a common issue that Kobe struggled with was the process that got him to achieve those 62 points that he made and that he placed his focus on the process, the actual process that actually created the mama mentality. So ADHD years, we also struggle with what is the actual anticipation of the reward, the process of getting there. So think of anticipation as motivation and excitement. Better yet, think of it as intention. It's the intention that advance goals through action, going from intention to action. That is why our condition should be named intention deficit disorder, because the intention is related to the dopamine deficit. You know, we should adapt to how our brain, our minds are created, meaning we have to find accommodations and strategies that are in line with how our ADHD brains respond to performance and productivity. We love performing well, right? We love to produce. We love to feel good about anticipating the ability to achieve greatness and success and optimal functioning. The problem is getting there, starting, finishing, getting past the anticipating the achievement to the actual achievement. That's where we struggle. And that's what I want you to focus on today, because that's what Kobe Bryant focused on. His mama mentality didn't focus on achieving the triple-double. His focus was on the process of what was needed to achieve the triple-double. So I invite you to look and journey with me to what I discovered is a 4P process system. Let's talk about the playbook that I mentioned here. In volume two of my book, The ADHD Lifestyle Series, I break down the 4P system I use to help prevent low motivation. Learn from my own ADHD, the worrying about being late propels me to plan early. The fear about being criticized, it really motivates me to stay on task. So having a system in place supports my desire to be ahead of the game. So let's break this down into small steps. Planning. Plan the list of the goals you want to accomplish for the day. Make sure you only have five uh, tasks on the list. Now, don't cheat now, because if a task requires to be broken down into smaller tasks, incremental tasks, put those as number two and number three. So instead of listing cleaning my work office, I'm going to list specific actions separately. Organize my bookcase, maybe clean or mop the floors, and get rid of the clutter on my desk. Oftentimes, we're unrealistic of what our human ADHD brains can accomplish in 24 hours, right? We list like 100 tasks. No, we're only setting ourselves up. And then guess what? That leads to us feeling bad. So we set up so ourselves up to fail practically. So planning it out helps you keep on pace to achieve what you can 
And remember, winning means to do your best work, not to achieve the overwhelming task list that your ADHD brain tells you you can achieve. Prepare. Prepare a list of what you need to plan. Consider this as your supporting cast. Make sure you have all of what you need before you start organizing, which leads to prioritizing. Start practical with placing the task deadlines first. So those that have an earlier deadline, let's place them first. And then let's use our ADHD creativity to prioritize further tasks. Let's consider moving to those tasks that we're less interested in, in completing, that we know we have to complete, and to pursue the tasks that we need to be broken down into smaller tasks that are so overwhelming for us to see as a whole. And then in with the tasks that require the less effort, the things we can do in our sleep. You may realize the order you choose to complete each task may change depending on our circumstances, our mood for the day, and also our interests. But set realistic timeframes for this prioritized list. Put them into your schedule, your calendar system, because that way you can focus both on your time management as well as your task management. Practicing this simple approach can lead to you consistently producing. And if goals are worth mentioning this, or if goals are worth setting, this is worth mentioning. However, this does not work all the time. And it does not also work for everyone. Some may find a cognitive behavioral therapist helpful with developing templates to understand the important points that get them off task on their journey. So there's not one way approach. There's no one way approach but finding a system to your process is key. So why are routines so difficult sometimes for us to follow? Well, because they're boring, right? If I did everything the same way every day of the week, it becomes boring for me. It's they're too rigid, you know, they're, they're, too, they're too specific. Routines can also be overwhelming. Um, distractions often affect our routines, right? This is where the purposeless activities are often achieved versus the purposeful, the ones we need to do are achieved last. We're less likely motivated or we lack motivation to even follow the routines. And then if you're like me and you're human, it takes about three weeks to three months to even establish a routine, even if we can get there, right? Especially with our ADHD brain. But I have three ways that you can actually look into how the journey of or the process of getting to accomplish your routine or your goals. Number one, let's spice up your routine. It creates excitement, increases interest, it improves focus. When we look at our routines and how boring that we are, a common question is, Brown, how can I get back on task? How can I, I know I need to do this. So what can I do to create that energy, create that drive, create that motivation to fulfill it? And when you spice it up, it improves the focus, which connects to our motivation and drive and leads to improved performance, the end product, the end product. So create a hybrid schedule, for example. You know, if you're blessed to go into work, you know, two days a week and stay at home, if, you, if that's your situation, we know that one, we're not desk workers. <laughs> we like excitement. We like movement. We like to do multiple things. I mean, this is especially um, serious for serial entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs like myself. We have our own schedule because it changes. It brings excitement. So change up the system. Even do the routine backwards. That may help. Number two, focus on what you're doing to create your routines and habits. So focus on what you're using, actually. You know, my routines consist of scheduling shorter work periods between breaks, right? Or having breaks in between. Rewarding myself immediately, which we often forget to do. We often think about, well, we're going to get our reward at the end once we get there. But my suggestion to you is reward each step of the process that it takes you to get to your ultimate goal. My routine also consists of accountability partners. Yeah, both are effective ways of providing and ma maintaining my level of motivation so that my journey actually ends to the success of accomplishing my goal. And finally, plan your rewards. Again, I cannot reiterate this enough. I often tell my patients and the athletes I work with to celebrate their progress. So in the ADHD world, if you're looking at a task list, it's about crossing off the list. It's about planning the vacations. It's about scheduling the me time. All these processes releases dopamine. So the anticipation or the intention here is the actual process. My focus is not on the completed list. 
It's on crossing off each task on the list. That's the difference. And that's what I want you to explore as a different way of accomplishing your goals. See, this is the perspective that I'm encouraging you to have. And this is redefining what winning means to the ADHD brain. Moving on to performance conditioning. You know, this is a pyramid that good athletes are taught to use to develop their athleticism. As you can see, it focuses on the process that it takes to obtain optimal physical conditioning, but only of the body. This pyramid represents an entire or elite athlete's approach, entire approach to optimal mental performance conditioning. This is what great athletes practice. So the same goes for us adults with ADHD. We must learn how to condition our brains to perform well. And I will get to how in the next few slides. What separates the good athletes from the great ones is the understanding and the practice of how athletes or how an athlete uses his or her potential, disallowing how the negative effects of pressure leads to performing their best work. So what are examples of pressure's negative impact? Well, we all as ADHD know these all too well, right? <laughs> what gets in the way of us doing our optimal best? These are the pressures, the overthinking, the indecisiveness, right? We often dwell on our mistakes. So we're doing something over and over again. We're thinking about the last time we did it and how we fell back poorly at it. It's our attention and distractibility that gets in the way in leading our journey forward to succeeding on that goal that we set for ourselves. It's our impulsive nature, our impulse control, our emotional reactivity, our arousal, our anxiety, right? If we don't eat, we don't sleep well, the muscles tight, you know, they get tight. We, that releases anxiety or that is a sign of anxiety. We don't necessarily see the vision of what we need to achieve. It becomes cloudy. All of these things can interfere and impact our, our, our journey of, of accomplishing our tasks. And the same dwells or exists for athletes. The injury or the pain, right, impacts their optimal performance. Their motivation as well, if low, they don't really do well. And also, if they have conflict with teams, right? We can see this with teams that we have. I consider team at home and team at work. <laughs> we have teams everywhere we work with. But again, if we're not effective in understanding defer, when knowing when to defer tasks, knowing when to take them on our own, yes, it can become pressure for us. What can adults do? With ADHD, what can what can they really learn? Excuse me, from ADHD and from sports psychology. Well, we can learn that sports psychology helps improves our psychological well being. It actually helps adults with ADHD develop coping skills. It reduces stress and anxiety. It helps athletes and adults with ADHD get into the zone of their work. It increases confidence, improves focus, teaches self awareness, improves motivation helps manage our irrational thoughts, which we often probably say they're creative, but really they're irrational. And it helps develop team cohesion with the people that we work with or the people we live with. And when we talk about physical conditioning routines, the physical conditioning focuses on the main factors. You know, as human beings, we have to eat, we have to sleep. I'll put in there, we must exercise too, right? But Let's break down what the focus and the process is anticipating a reward. Let's talk about the mental conditioning because that's often left out. See, the intention that drives us to get the job done. This is where I break down the difference between having good mindset and having optimal mental conditioning. Like an athlete, we have to practice and work at our ADHD on a daily basis. I look at these terms as a simple way of identifying what is needed to achieve optimal success at championing your ADHD. So let's look at mindset. It creates the foundation. Like the mental pyramid of conditioning, it's the attitude that is created that one needs to conquer the achievement. Whereas mental conditioning, as you see here, is the actual process or practice that helps structure our mindset. Mindset is the attitude and it's instrumental at determining our success. Mental conditioning, on the other hand, helps us to build and strengthen our mindset or attitude. With mindset, our attitudes are not solely based on talent or hard work, like with an athlete, but on mental strength. 
And when we practice mental conditioning, it helps us to attain the mental strength necessary to achieve challenging goals. So ultimately, as I'm explaining here in so many words, but can just put it, it's not about the destination, right? It's about the process to get there. Ultimately, it's the process of thoughts and beliefs that help guide our emotions or vice versa, which in turn lead to behaviors and actions and ultimately performance. And if we are to focus on the process, then what does this entail? What does it look like? Well, for an athlete, it may look like visualizations, imagining them shooting, you know, that, that ball or hitting the ball on the mound, you know, in, in baseball. For an individual with ADHD, I want to focus on you all because this is who I'm being speaking with. And the best way to address our executive fun dysfunction involves targeting the point of performance and changing the ADHD's environment. People with ADHD don't respond well to internal cues. We got to change that. They're so unreliable for us. So we have to provide our own accommodations and strategies for externalizing time. We can do this through visualization. Visual timers, calendars, whiteboards, chalkboards, you know, all of these can help better guide our behaviors to achieve our, our goal. Relaxation techniques, meditation, praying. But I also incorporate brain dumps. Oh, my patients know I love brain dumps. Every night, 15 minutes before bed, I actually do brain dumps. I write down everything that comes to mind because I know my mind is highly active at night. That's when it's most active. <laughs> I think about everything, things that I don't need to be thinking about because I need to be sleeping. Things don't really have purpose. So why am I thinking about them? And you'll always notice that with an ADHD brain, you're creating your to-do list in your brain. So let's do a brain dump. It's used to place for, it's a place where we release Overwhelming thoughts or ideas, simply writing it down, releasing them can help. This conditioning or relaxation principle helps clear your mind to focus on your current task. And for me, at the time of night, that's sleeping. <laughs> Self-talk and affirmations. This is a daily practice of mine. You know, at the beginning, middle, and end of the day, I literally talk out loud and affirm the day's task of what I wrote down in my calendar. I also acknowledge that I may be anxious for an event, but what comes after that is telling myself that I will do my very best because I prepared and I put forth the effort to do so. Affirmations are positive statements that can help brighten your outlook out on your task list, out on your world. When you say them to yourself regularly or write them down, it really works. Those who swear by the power of this uplifting language do find it increases motivation, their self-esteem and improves their mindset. It gets your mental, it's the process, the mental conditioning of getting your brain going and strengthening that mindset. And if you're looking to form and strengthen better mental health habits, this is a great and free place to start. Not to mention, it may also help boost your overall mental health too. Mental performance conditioning means doing this as a form of daily practice. Let's move on to the essential meal plan. Well, the brain's fuel primarily is oxygen and glucose. See, breaking it down, blood carries oxygen and glucose to our brain. Blood is made of water. So when I talk to athletes, I'm like, hey, if you're dehydrated, your brain is gonna start to slow down. Your mental is gonna get, you know, you're gonna get clumsy in your performance. Your, your mental um, cognition or clarity may become a little bit sluggish. And if, even if you restrict meals we'll, or wait longer to eat, we also may know this to be the case. Oftentimes when we feel tired or irritable or mentally fatigued, a common question is how can we get back in the game? I encourage you, just like I encourage athletes, let's learn how our brains work. And from the previous slides, you know that we need glucose and we also need water. So drink water and eat complex carbohydrates. I see too many athletes and adult ADHDers that become tired or irritable and have problems with their mental clarity and forgetfulness. They make careless mistakes and simply because they haven't eaten or they're dehydrated, not drinking enough water. And I know this is simple, but it's true. If we know the basis of how we operate and how our brain functions, we can come up with practical solutions. But how does this relate to our mood, our emotional regulation? How do we regulate our emotions well? to the point where we have good control. Well, how I describe this is that we have to feed our personalities 
or you could become grumpy, irritable, or mad. It's all a part of how we're created. We must sleep, eat, and exercise too in order to function healthy and optimally. Be mindful that types of glucose or sugar or the imbalance can also lead to other things that we don't want, weight gain, irritability, or crash-like effects. But drinking water and eating complex carbohydrates, the next time I challenge you, when you're feeling unmotivated, when you're feeling irritable, when you're feeling tired or inattentional. Complex carbs pack more nutrients than simple carbs. They're higher in fiber and digest slowly. This also makes them more filling because you know, us with ADHD, we often skip meals because we're focused on getting something done, right? But if we eat complex carbohydrates, they're good feelers. And as your physician, I'm okay, okay and satisfied that you're also eating because eating also improves focus sustainment. And I refer to ADHD as diabetes of the endocrine system. You know, diabetes, if you look at diabetes and you also look at ADHD, you know, they're both similar in their deficits. For the diabetic, their pancreas is deficient in making insulin. For the ADHD, their brain is deficient in making dopamine, serotonin, what, norepinephrine, all these neurotransmitters, these chemicals in the brain. And they all have, so this is a similar uh, pathology that they share, the deficiency. And the decrease in dopamine for the ADHD brain and insulin for diabetic, when it's actually replenished, carbohydrates, for example, are ideal for people with uh, diabetes because it helps manage their blood sugar spikes after meals. Just like taking our medications, for example, or exercising or getting good night's rest, all those things in accomplishing tasks releases dopamine, which gets us ready for the next event or task. You know, I always say this, it's not about diet, but it's about lifestyle. You know, ADHD doesn't go away. You know, we, we're born with this condition. You know, there's a lot of research out there and there's no research that I'm familiar with that tells us that ADHD automatically comes when we're 31 or 32 years old, right? Now the diagnosis may come and may give us clarity as to, oh, this is what it is. And this is why I've had struggles all my life. And this is why I've been compensating, but it's a lifestyle. So just like us having to practice our ADHD every day, we're not dieting. We have to eat a certain way every single day. So this is not really about dieting. I think a dieting is short term. It's really about creating a lifestyle that we practice every single day. So I give a simple way in, in volume one of ADHD lifestyle series is to look at the three F's. Remember the three F's. Omega fatty acids, like fish, salmon, avocados, walnuts, folate, found in beans and asparagus and broccoli, collard greens, and fiber found in the skin of fruits and vegetables and whole grains, you know, these are important ways to replenish and replenish the fuel that you need in order to perform optimally. And it's important to eat a balanced diet. You know, eat the recommended portions that your family medicine doctor, your internist tell you about vegetables and fruits and proteins and carbs, minerals and vitamins. It is important because we don't necessarily get them all from our foods or from the environment. Sometimes we have to supplement our meals with such items. And the pharmacological management, this is what I do. I'm a psychiatrist, can't help it. I believe in pharmacology, I do. Because I understand the brain and I understand that part of the pathology of an ADHD brain is biologically impacted. So we can't control how much dopamine we don't produce or how much serotonin we don't produce. We have to replace what our brain doesn't make enough of. And that's what pharmacology can be very beneficial to those who may have moderate or severe ADHD because you know it's a spectrum. We all don't have mild cases of ADHD. Some of our cases like mine are moderate and others may be severe. So some of us like me require pharmacological management so I can focus on giving you this presentation day so I can follow the, the tips and the tools and resources I've studied and present them to you in a distinct and, dis and, and direct way. It replaces, our, you know, medicines replace what our brain's not making enough of. And I showed you in the previous slide how dopamine and serotonin pathways are involved in that brain reward circuit as well and how deficiencies for dopamine and serotonin can become problematic, especially for those who have ADHD regarding their inattentions, attention, inhibitions, and regulations of their moods and behaviors. 
And although I focus on creating balanced meals and exercise routines for a developing mind, I also wrote a book on this. And, it, you know, it works well just for adults, just as it does for kids with ADHD, because we now know it's about the process of creating and practicing ways to balance our meals and routines that will lead us to doing our best. And that's what matters. And that's where there's not just one winner, but it's a place where we all win. I want to acknowledge and thank the athletes and parents who helped me realize the winning perspective. Thanks to Carly for your help in making me accountable for getting this presentation to you on time. And thank you so much the editor of Attitude, Ms. Carol Flagg, for allowing me to the opportunity to speak and engage with the Attitude community. And thanks to you, the audience, attending today's webinar, those live and those who will view this on the replay. I hope to have, I have provided you with a different perspective on how to use sports psychology to champion your own ADHD. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. That was so interesting and informative. Uh, before we start the Q&A, I'd like to thank Inflow once more for sponsoring this webinar. I'd also like to share results from today's poll question. If you've abandoned a routine, what helped you to get back in the game? The top answers were, I broke down tasks into smaller steps, which is exactly what you had recommended followed by I improved my mindset, I relied on external tools to stay on track, I limited distractions, and I found an, ac an accountability partner. Um, so now to your questions um, from the audience. I'm an athlete with ADHD. Do you have tips for regulating emotions and rejection sensitivity during competitions when I have experienced bullying behavior from teammates and opponents? Yes, you know, that's a tough one um, because athletes, if it's one population that I've recognized that have been bullied from childhood, it's, it's a lot of athletes. And we don't realize that this bullying, unfortunately, but thankfully creates resilience for many athletes. It's the multiple failures that they're bullied for, that they're criticized for, that they're talked about. And what I recommend for that athlete is to continue to practice your mindset, continue to incorporate fight, or if you are, incorporate affirmations. Understand that you are there for a reason, that you've accomplished that goal and your team wants you. <laughs> no one, not you, just your skill level, but it took mentation to get you there. A good, healthy, strengthened mental processing or conditioning to help get you there. So in order to maintain that, you have to practice affirmations. Meditation works, you know, to get those anxieties, you know, released when someone is criticizing you. Some of my athletes actually during break times or even when they're running down the court, they're breathing differently. You know, you don't have time to go to the, you know, the bench and, um, you know, do these breathing techniques or, you know, meditate. But you have to learn how you can incorporate that while you're playing the game. And so that's one on one work that I often you know, do with elite athletes that they find helpful so that whatever they're being criticized for the last play that they didn't make, it's not still in their mind. It's actually going forward to the next play that they're visualizing. OK, um, another question is, how can athletes keep focused when our, when our bodies start to hurt and we're so tired, how can we dig deep to stay on track? Yeah, you know, getting back in the game when you're tired is very difficult. That's why the Florida Gators created Gatorade. <laughs> you know, they knew that this supplement that contained carb carbohydrates, um, and that's what you see on the commercials, right? You don't see someone who's a non-athlete drink this. Next time you look at a Gatorade or Powerade commercial, you see someone who has intense work out or athletes on the screen. So, you know, you want to do that with physical. You know, you want to understand that some of your tiredness is because of physical tiredness. Your body just feels in pain. It's tired. Sometimes, you know, replenishing what has been lost from working out can help. But we also know that part of conditioning, practicing it, right? So when you get to the game, that's not the time to understand what can work. But it's the conditioning process, and that's why athletes take conditioning so relentlessly and seriously, is because they actually train their minds and their bodies to actually be, um, to maintain their strength and their energy so they can actually play all four quarters or two halves of the game. And so I do recommend 
a good sleep regimen. You know, I know that's not necessarily the case all the time that you can afford yourself, but make sure that when you do sleep, that you're sleeping well. Create an environment that's going to allow you to sleep well. Sleeping is underestimated, undermining how important it is and affects every single thing that we do. But particularly for athletes, it is isn't part of replenishing. When we sleep, we heal. When we sleep, we gain energy. So sleep is, is important. And the other factors we mentioned in the slide today, eating, right, and, and conditioning are also important as well. We had quite a few questions around how people can prepare themselves to be less afraid of failure and how to prepare for setbacks and accept them in a calm way. Yeah. You know, as a perfectionist, and I'm still working on this, I see a therapist on this, I'm still working on it. It's a process. It's a process. But what I've learned is that, in particularly being a serial entrepreneur really prepared me for this, is that I know I'm going to fail. I have to accept that I'm going to fail. And me focusing on that work with my therapy sessions, I'm able to focus on how I feel about failing. I'm able to focus on what that looks like, how can I manage that so it doesn't interfere my relationships, it doesn't interfere my confidence or my self-worth, it doesn't feel interfere my self-esteem so that it prevents me from, you know, my work being reflective of my ability. And when I spend time on that, um, and knowing that failure is where I learn the best. That's where I'm able to strengthen my skills and understand that there's different ways to get to the answer. Um, and then, you know, connect with others and they realize the same. It's natural. So I know that I fail, you know, and, and, and I've come to terms with how I'm able to regulate that. Um, using, you know, again, kind of behavioral therapy, um, practicing things over and over again, but it really just starts accepting that it's a part of the process. And when you accept it as a part of the process, you know that success feels better. It feels different. But reward yourself. You know, in order to under and, and feel that success, you have to reward yourself. Oftentimes, we're working on one thing and we're already on to the next. We didn't really take time to satisfy the reward that we made um, in, in the moment. We don't spend enough time in the moment. And I think that's where the stress can also exacerbate kind of stress, you know, the failing mentality. Um, so I, I recommend doing those things and seeing how you view failure after you practice it. Some people, speaking of rewards, did ask for examples of some rewards. Mm -hmm. um, a few people talked about candy. Some talked about online shopping. So not necessarily habits you want to get, you know, want to incorporate. So do you have some examples? I do. I think those are good examples. It's just about when you do them. Like, I don't want to look at shopping when I'm at work because I already know, if you know your ADHD mind, right? And you know you're likely to have multiple tabs open like me. You get to Macy's, you get to Dillard's, you get to other, you know, you know, you just find yourself hyper focused on shopping while you're at work. It doesn't work. But maybe at the end of my day, and I time myself for an hour. You know, the apps now, the social media apps have in their settings where you can actually time yourself. There are blockers that apps are creating that actually shut off your phone or shut off that particular website that you're on if you can't, you know, internally um, put blockers or um, um, what I would say strategies up, right? You have to put boundaries up so that you're not going over that and it becomes something that you're hyper-focused on. Rewards can consist of candy, it consists of me time. I find that my rewards are relieving stress, so I love vacationing. I love um, massages. <laughs> I love um, chocolate. So, you know, those things that um, are healthy for me, those things that I look forward to, the actual planning it already releases dopamine. So I don't have to, you know, struggle through the process of achieving this particular, um, you know, goal I set for myself. If I actually just start planning the reward that I'm going to set for myself, I work different. I'm anticipating that after I get through some this, this thing that I'm interested in or have this interest in, there's a vacation around the corner. You know, you just work different. Um, and so, yeah, rewards can be what I tell my patients and clients, big or small. It's up to you how you plan them. But what works for me is how I relieve stress. And so that's what I plan for my rewards. And making sure the timing of the rewards is going to work well for you and not become a distraction. 
Someone wrote, I play adult sports and end up coaching and playing on multiple adult teams. When I'm out on the field, I'm a different person. I'm confident, I'm focused, I'm proud of who I am, win or lose. However, in my work, I'm the complete opposite. What are some tips to help me achieve the same feeling when I work as when I'm coaching and playing in sports? This is a great question. And this is a, a common problem that a lot of athletes have. They feel that they're the champion on the field or on the court, but at home, they're not so much the champion, right? And so what I encourage you to do as an athlete is recognize what makes you that champion when you're in your sport. What builds that confidence? Is it the crowd around you that creates the excitement and the energy, the, you know, cheering your name that, that you need um, in order to I increase your confidence? If that is the case, then get an accountability partner and, and, let, and, and, and basically seriously, you know, tell them, hey, I need your approval. I, not your approval, but I need your support, right? I need your encouragement. Um, if, if you are someone in, that has a spouse, you know, Rewards work for me. Tell me that I'm, you know, I'm really good at what I did, you know, when I, when I finished this goal, you know, try to find similar things in th that environment of your sport and create that for other environments where you don't feel that level of confidence, where you're not achieving that level or degree of optimal functioning or performance and see if that can work for you. But it's really about things along the way, the process and seeing you can incorporate that in other areas. Um, earlier in your presentation, you talked about the importance of complex carbs, mm -hmm. and um, several people have asked, what are some examples of the complex carbs we should eat before the gym or before a team sport? Mm -hmm. And I also had a few questions around intermittent fasting and how you feel mm -hmm. about that. Yes. Complex carbs are like the three Fs too. So these are carbohydrates that you find in fiber, right? Um, the skin of the fruit, um, folate. Complex carbs are things that your body can break down. They're not candy bars. They're not soda, you know, soda, they found in soda cans. You know, those are simple carbs, right? Those are, these are the items. If you can think of the things where you crash on. So if I eat a lot of chocolate or if I give my son and daughter, they're the great examples. Sorry, kids. If you're giving your son or daughter or your little one a lot of chocolate or, you know, a lot of degrees of, of caffeine or caffeinated beverages, which contain high simple sugars, they're going to have a crash-like effect. You're going to immediately see irritability, like, you know, blindness of their attitude. Sometimes they may fall asleep. These are the carbs that create fullness. These are the carbs that allow you to focus better. So focus on the foods that have fiber, protein, um, the fatty acid, the good fat, right? Focus on those. So it's, it's about, if you go back in the slides, those type of foods that I placed there, those are some good examples of complex carbs. Intermittent fasting, you know, a lot of us do intermittent fasting with the goal of achieving and maintaining weight loss. That's why I, I hear about the most when we're talking about intermittent fasting. But I want to invite you to have another perspective of intermittent fasting because a lot of times intermittent fasting, it goes along and works along with how we're created, how our bodies are created, right? So it may work for some of us who have ADHD and it may not work for others who do. And what I mean by that is that there are certain populations, whether you're an athlete or not, depending on your ADHD and your style of ADHD, I may recommend, no, you got to feed your personality. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. I know it's cliche, but you have to eat because that we recognize with your brain that it also helps with your focus sustainment, for example. But for others with, who have skip meals or they've actually conditioned their mindset or their bodies to go, you know, fasting and start eating at 12 and they get a lot of things done, hey, intermittent fasting may work for them. So it's not necessarily focused on restricting the meals, but it's focusing on the alignment of how our mind and bodies can do well without having food at the beginning of our day. So breaking the fast, that's what it means, right? We're breaking the fast, breakfast, excuse me, breakfast means breaking the fast. So for some of those, it works. For others, it may, it may actually be counterintuitive. And so learning your ADHD is going to be um, very, very key in determining that. What, what are some good examples of like on-the-go things you can eat that are healthy? You know, people with ADHD, some are frequently running late, either to mm -hmm. work or, um, or, or to the gym. Um, is, is there, 
Are there a few things in particular that would be good to grab yeah. it on the way? I, I do agree. So like simple carbos, like so apples, for example, pears, you know, this is the best source of fiber, best source of carbohydrates that you can eat on the go. And they're simple natural sugars. So we're not necessarily eating processed foods that you don't know how to pronounce or that you don't know how to read, right? Because they're hard to pronounce on the back of your nutritional guidelines on your food items. But these are things that are grown from the earth, you know, green, leafy vegetables. If you can, you know, find those things. Sometimes people eat greens without cooking them. <laughs> lettuce, you know, lettuce has, you know, no calories. And I always tell people with um, ADHD that if you're on the go, if you can just heat up a quick bowl of vegetables and put them in a plastic container and eat them on your way, like collard greens or broccoli, man you will notice a huge difference, not with just your energy levels, but with your focus, your, men your mental capacity, your mental clarity. You know, it, it really does matter that they contain antioxidants, they contain a good source of folate and vitamins and minerals that really help the brain work at its optimal level. Protein bars also created, some may have unprocessed things in them, so be careful of that. Look on the side of the nutritional meal and always, of course, talk to your doctor about these foods. Um, but protein bars are a really good source of simple carb, I mean, excuse me, complex carbohydrates as well. So these are some of the things that may be wrapped and packaged um, that you can actually enjoy eating and you can notice a difference with how you function. Okay. So we have some questions around um, how to get past the fear of competition, the fear of failure, and even just getting started because of that fear of failure. Do you have um, some advice to share? Yeah, you know, again, like I said before, I know mean, we had a very similar question to this. You have to accept that failure will happen. You have to accept that. Um, and because that's how we were created. We weren't created to come out the womb successful. You know, we were created to have natural gifts and talents, but we were created to nurture them. So that's why I focus on the process. What is the process of achievement? And that's where eight people with ADHD is the intention. It's the intention that gets in the way, right? So it's creating what we need in order to get past that, in order to progress the journey forward. And so it's something that you're going to fail at times. It's just going to happen. But the fear, but failing, let's not fear it. Let's accept it and let's embrace it because we can learn from it. And again, it's about having that mindset of what failure is. I mean, I think of it as a spirit and inner competition with myself. It's not about having another person or like an athlete across from you and you fail guarding them well. That's not what it is. No, it's about your own potential. And that's where failure often is reflected on, but we project it on other things, right? So it's, it's really internalized and it should be internalized so that we can accept it, we can work on it, we can actually know what tools and resources we need to learn more how we can you know, accomplish or overcome failure to reach the goal. But it, it's different for everyone and, and that's what makes it so complicated. And that's why I know this question is a, a very good one and it often comes up because oftentimes it gets in the way of our greatest achievements, the things that we know we're capable and able to do. Um, and our last question is, is there a way that I can attain focus and grit to get the same level of passion that athletes have about their game? Someone mm. asks. Mm -hmm. Work out. <laughs> 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 you know, you don't have to be an elite athlete to do this, but eat well, sleep well. And like I said, have the mentality that you have to exercise. You have to. You know, how long can we go without eating and sleeping? We can't. How long can we go without exercising? We can. But if you change that perspective and knowing you have to do that, that's going to naturally get you that grit. And that's going to naturally want you to be able to go on that journey and perform at your best. Because the natural things happen along the way. You release that dopamine. You release the norepinephrine and adrenaline. The body heals. That's why runners are so, I'm in Houston, runners are so addictive to, to running outside. They don't have to be an athlete, but they run every day because of how they feel, what running makes them, how they feel, how they feel after, right? Know what, you know, write down, remind yourself how you feel after you accomplish that 
five mile run exercise that you do. You know, you gotta put things in place on the process, um, using affirmations, sleeping well, eating well, in order to get to you know that 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 um, that that goal or task that you want to achieve. So I I believe that incorporating exercise, just like athletes do, because you have the natural skill and talent to do what you do well. You just want that grit, right? The, the, the motivation, the energy, the vibe, the creativity to get you there. And I think that um, using our natural abilities and what our brain and our bodies are designed to do, exercise can really help us get there quicker. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Brown, for joining us today and for sharing your expertise with our ADHD community. It was really great. Um, next week, our free webinar is titled Five Life Skills Every ADHD Young Adult Needs to Cultivate with Elaine Taylor Klaus and Diane Dempster. We hope you can join us. Make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, articles, or research updates by signing up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com newsletters. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.